We ask for the Holy Congregation to kneel with us at this time as we begin to go into the spoken word at this time. Please pray with us. Our Father and our God, which art in heaven, thank you so much for giving us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that we're living upon the ends of the world and that the Bible is a testimony and a revelation to those that are living in the last days of earth's history. We thank you for all the divine rays of the light that has been accumulating for the ages and that you've bound up these treasures for this final generation. And we don't want to disappoint you as ambassadors, as missionary workers for Jesus Christ. You've given us the divine commission to proclaim the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And you've also allowed us to be partakers of your divine nature. And I thank you for the, the formula that you have given in Peter's ladder, Jacob's ladder, which is a symbol of Christ. Thank you for the angels that help us to climb and ascend these Christian graces and virtues all the way to the top, the top of Mount Zion. Amen. I pray that your spirit would be breathed into our hearts and our minds. I also pray that you would help us to drink from the fountain of living waters, and that we would eat from the, the showbread, that we would eat from uh, Christ himself, his flesh, and also his blood, um, that we might live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, that the word would destroy the earthly carnal nature and produce in us the heavenly spiritual nature of Christ. And give us understanding, I pray, and may that which is preached to us today benefit us being mixed with faith in them that hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath to everyone. We continue in our series dealing with the fruitful fig tree. The last couple of Sabbaths that I've been present, we were able to speak about virtue. And now we are moving to the third round of Peter's ladder. This is the ladder of Christian experience. This is also the entrance that has been provided to us by heaven's agency so that you and I can gain access into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that you and I will not be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the third round in the ladder is knowledge. Now, what type of knowledge are we speaking about? Because we know that there is the knowledge of God's character. There is the knowledge of prophecy, the knowledge of doctrine, the knowledge of health reform and dress reform, the knowledge of true education, the knowledge of country living. What knowledge are we speaking about? And we want to be specific today because inspiration is specific and to the point. And so I want to read to you a passage that I've given to you before in other handouts dealing with partaking of the divine nature. This is coming from Acts of the Apostles, beginning on page 530, paragraph 3. Acts of the Apostles, page 530. Paragraph 3. Having received the faith of the gospel, the next work of the believer is to add to his character virtue, and thus cleanse the heart and prepare the mind for the reception of the knowledge of God. So before the mind can receive the knowledge of God, it must first be cleansed by virtue. And then it says, this knowledge is the foundation of all true education and of all 
true service. So I want you to understand that the knowledge that we are to add to virtue and faith is the knowledge that is the foundation of all true education and all true service. It is the only real safeguard against temptation. And it is this alone that can make us one like God in character. So two things I want you to notice. First of all, this knowledge is the foundation of all true education and all true service. And this knowledge is the only real safeguard against temptation. So then when the prophet says the only real safeguard against temptation, what does that mean? That if we are lacking in the knowledge that teaches us the basis of true education and true service, then we have no protection. We have no safety. We have nothing to barricade us from temptation. Therefore, we would yield to temptation and we would commit sin. And it is the only thing that can make us like God in character. So the knowledge of true education, the only real safeguard against temptation, and also it makes us one like God in character. So what does that mean? That even though we know what the faith of the gospel is, the faith of the gospel is the faith that was once delivered to the saints, the 43 and 50 chart. But brethren, having the faith alone does not make us one with God in character. Neither can these heavenly truths, these wonderful and advanced truths of the third angel, protect us from yielding to temptation. Even virtue by itself cannot make us one with God in character. Neither can virtue alone be a real safeguard against falling into temptation and sin. We have to have faith and virtue combined with knowledge, which is true education and true service. It goes on. Through the knowledge of God and his son Jesus Christ are given to the believer all things that pertain unto life and godliness. No good gift is withheld from him who sincerely desires to obtain the righteousness of God. This is life eternal, Christ said, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And the prophet Jeremiah declared, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glorieth in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Scarcely can the human mind comprehend the breadth and depth and height of the spiritual attainments of him who gains this knowledge. So there are spiritual attainments that we have not obtained in our Christian experience because we have not had this knowledge with our virtue and with our faith. What is this knowledge? It is the foundation of all true education and all true service. It is the only real safeguard against temptation, and it is this alone that can make us like God in character. Now, I want to read one other statement before we go into our Bible. This is found in Education, page 15. Education, as a matter of fact, we're going to start in page 14, paragraph 4. So if you have your smartphones or your iPads and you want to follow along, you have the spirit of prophecy on your devices. Education, ED, Page 14, paragraph 4. We're going to read a few paragraphs here. So the knowledge that we're talking about in Peter's ladder is not the knowledge of dress reform. It's not the knowledge of health reform. It's not the knowledge of the more sure word of prophecy. It's the knowledge of true education that Peter's ladder is telling us that we are to add to in the next round. So then, education, page 14, 
is going to identify for us what is true education. Remember, this is the only real safeguard against temptation. It is, the, it is this alone that can make us like God in character. So if you want to be kept from yielding to temptation, if you want to be like God in character, then we need to understand what is true education. In order to understand what is comprehended in the work of education, we need to consider both the nature of man and the purpose of God in creating him. We need to consider also the change in man's condition through the coming in of a knowledge of evil and God's plan for still fulfilling his glorious purpose in the education of the human race. When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. So notice, when Adam came forth from the Creator's hand, he bore a likeness to his Maker in physical, mental, and spiritual nature. Notice that his nature is made up of three things. How many things? Physical, mental and spiritual. Now, why three things? What do you think the physical, mental, and spiritual is pointing us to? The three angels' messages and the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very good. God created man in his own image, and it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal this image the more fully reflect the glory of the Creator. All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor were continually to increase. So as long as man lived, he was to continue to reflect this image, the glory of the Creator. He was to continue to learn and to expand and to advance in reflecting the image of the glory of God. Vast was the scope offered for their exercise, glorious the field open to their research, the mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge, invited man's study. Face to face, heart to heart communion with his maker was his high privilege. What was man's high privilege? Face to face, and heart-to-heart -heart communion with his maker. That was his high privilege. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. Throughout eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh springs of happiness, and to obtain clearer and yet clear conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. More and more fully would he have fulfilled the object of his creation. More and more fully have reflected the creator's glory. So what is the object of our creation? Very simply put, is to more and more reflect the creator's glory. Not just in this life, but even in the life to come, in the earth made new, we are to still continue to grow more and more into the image of Jesus. So just when you thought that you came to the point, this side of eternity, where you've reflected the image of your creator, this is just nothing more than a graduation from this earth to the earth made new, where we continue to bear the image of the Creator throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Which means that you'll never come to a point where you say, I have arrived. This far have I come and no further will I go. Because when you stop growing, when you stop advancing and stop reflecting, then you're no longer fulfilling the purpose, the divine purpose and object of your creation. But by disobedience, this was forfeited. That's why Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the what? You see, brethren, every time we sin, because we lack this 
knowledge of true education, which is the only real safeguard against temptation, we fall short of the Creator's glory. We fall short of fulfilling the purpose of our existence. Through sin, the divine likeness was marred and well nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were weakened. His mental capacity was lessened, his spiritual vision dimmed. So notice, physical powers weaken, mental capacity lessen, and spiritual vision dim. You see, sin affects these three parts of man. We are to give God glory physically, mentally, and spiritually, but sin weakens our powers lessens our mental capacity, and spiritual vision is dimmed. Speaking about man, he had become subject to death, yet the race was not left without hope, praise God. By infinite love and mercy, the plan of salvation had been devised, and a life of probation was granted. Now listen to this to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. So what is the great object of life? What is the object of education? It's the work of redemption. And what is the work of redemption? To restore back in man the physical, mental, and spiritual perfection that he had before sin entered into the world. That is the purpose of education the work of redeeming us back into the image of him that created us. Continuing, love, the basis of creation and of redemption is the basis of true education. Wait a minute, what is the, the basis or the foundation of true education? The same basis of creation and redemption is love. Therefore, we could say then that true education is nothing more than a revelation of God's love. So then when we're reflecting the Creator's glory physically, mentally, and spiritually, what we're simply doing is, is reflecting or giving a revelation of His love. That is why he created us. That is why he redeemed us. And the purpose of true education is to restore us back into the image of our maker or to recreate us back into that sinless image. This is the work of redemption. This is the great object of education. This is made plain talking about love being the basis of true education. This is made plain in the law that God has given as the guide of life. The first and great commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. To love him, the infinite, the omniscient one, with the whole strength and mind and heart, what does that mean? Because we talk about loving God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul. But what does that really mean today? This is what it means. It means the highest development of every power. It doesn't stop there. It means that in the whole being, the body the mind as well as the soul, the image of God is to be restored. So what does it mean to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? It means the highest development of every power. It means to restore the image of man 
to restore in the image of man or to restore back in man the image of God. That is what it means to love God with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength. Like the first is the second commandment. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The law of love calls for the devotion of body, mind, and soul to the service of God and our fellow men. And this service, while making us a blessing to others, brings the greatest blessing to ourselves. So it is impossible for me and all of us here to be reflecting the image of our Creator, physically, mentally, and spiritually, and yet keep these blessings to ourselves. Shut up or shut out from the rest of the world. It's impossible. Because if the law of self-sacrificing love is in us, then that means then that we're going to be a blessing to others. But in being a blessing to others, we bring great blessings to ourselves. How many stand in the need of great blessings? I know I do. So why would you shut yourselves out? Why would you disqualify yourself from receiving these great blessings while you, in turn, are not a blessing to humanity? In blessing humanity, you were to receive the greatest blessings. It goes on to say, unselfishness underlies all true development. Through unselfish service, we receive the highest culture of every faculty. And finally, more and more fully do we become partakers of the divine nature. We are fitted for heaven, for we receive heaven into our hearts. Education, page 14 to 16. Now, I have not yet done a complete study on this, but the two tables of the law, written by the finger of God, love to God, love to man. God has also given us two tables. If I may be so bold, love for God, the 43 chart, love for man, the 50 chart. Now, I'm just putting that out there. Like I said, that's, that's what's going on in my mind right now, but I have not yet sat down to study that out further. We need this knowledge of true education. If we're going to have the image of God restored in us, if we're going to, in our mind, body, and soul, reflect the Creator's masterpiece and glory, fulfill the object of our creation, then we need the knowledge of true education and of true service because true education means true service. Everybody that has been educated after the order and principles of heaven is a missionary in the highest order. So then, faith, virtue, and now the knowledge of God which is true education. This is the only real safeguard against temptation. It is this alone that can make us like God in character. So you have faith, you have virtue, but now you need knowledge. We need true education because we have to be restored back into the image of God that made us. So let us turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22. This will be a large study, so obviously we're not going to finish it all today. And that's okay, because God has blessed us where, for the whole year, for the last nine months, going into the 10th month, we've been studying the same subject, believe it or not. There's many facets and many layers of truth in God's Word. So think about studying one subject for nine months. And have we exhausted anything? So how do you think it's going to be in heaven when the line of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, is unsealing to us the little book? Will we learn throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
true education. Proverbs chapter 22, beginning in verse 17. We're going to begin to just lay down some principles dealing with true education. You notice that true education covers the physical, the mental, and spiritual. This is what you and I need in order to reveal God's love. The reason why we can't reveal God's love is because we're not in God's image. Love, the basis of creation and redemption, is the basis of all true education. And notice what the Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 17. It says, Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. Why does God say bow down thy ear? What do you think of when someone is bowing down? Listen closely, yes. Humble yourself, amen. Humble yourself. This is what the Bible means. We have to humble our ears to hear because of pride and selfishness and love of the world. We don't want to hear it. So we have to humble our ears to hear the words of the wise. And as we hear the words of the wise, we need to apply thine heart unto my knowledge or take the knowledge and apply it to our heart. Otherwise, it does us no good. God doesn't want us to be, as sinners, wise to do evil, but in regarding doing good, we have no knowledge. Verse 18 says, For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. Question, does anyone have a marginal reading in their Bible for the phrase within thee? For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. Some Bibles have Marginal readings, you might have a letter next to it where it says, within thee. In your belly. Yes, very good. So wait a minute, let's read that again. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them in your belly. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. Wait a minute, how does knowledge, the words of the wise, get in your belly? How do you get something in your belly? You Got to eat it. And it will be fitted in your lips. How does it get in your lips? You eat it to go down in your belly. So when we're talking about in verse 18, it's a pleasant thing if thou keep them within your belly and they shall be fitted within thy lips. You have to eat this knowledge. You have to eat this little book. You have to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man. Verse 19. Now, what is the purpose of eating the little book, eating the words of the wise and the knowledge of the Most High, that thy trust may be in the Lord. I've made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and what? That I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that sent unto thee. So God has written unto us excellent things in counsels and in knowledge. Why has God written to us? Why has God given to us a, the textbook of true education and knowledge, the Bible? The Bible is to be the foundation of every doctrine, the basis of every reform. It is the, it is the, the test and standard of all Christian experience and character. Why has God written these things for us? That we might know him, that our trust might be in, in him. What else? that you might give an answer to those that sin unto thee. And how do you give an answer to somebody? How do you give an answer? You yourself have to know the certainty of the words of truth. Amen? Amen. So you know with certainty the words of truth, and then you can give an answer with, with assurance and with confidence and certainty. Now, let's continue with the same line of thought as to why God has written unto us the words of knowledge of true education, that we might be restored back into the image of him that created us, that we might more and more reflect the glory of the creator and answer the object and purpose of our creation. I want you to turn with me now to the book of Job, Job 21. 
22. True education is about having an experimental relationship with our Creator. Knowing Him through the certainty of the words of truth and giving an answer to those that ask. It's a pleasant thing if the knowledge can remain in your belly and be in your lips. Because what's in your belly is going to come forth out of your mouth. And we know that there is an intricate relationship between the food that we eat and the words that we speak, our character, our behavior, and our actions. Job 22, beginning in verse 21. The Bible says, Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. What does it mean to acquaint now thyself with him? What does that mean? Acquaint yourself with someone. What does that mean? Get to know them. Receiving a knowledge of the person. Verse 22, how do we acquaint ourselves with God? How do we get to know him? It says, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth. What is the law from his mouth? The Ten Commandments. These are all the words that God spake and wrote with his own finger upon two tables of stone. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words where? In thy, heart. thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse 23, if thou return to the Almighty, why do we have to return? How did we go astray? What, what did... What did Adam and Eve do that caused them to go astray? They sinned. So we have to return back to the Almighty in order that we might have his image restored in us, the glory of the Creator. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up, built up in his image, built up physically, mentally, and spiritually. Thou shalt put away what? Far from thy tabernacle. So what is the purpose of our knowledge of God? and getting to know him, and receiving the law from his mouth, and hiding the words in our hearts. What is the purpose of us returning to him, and being built up in him? What's the purpose? Put away iniquity. Turn with me in your Bible now to the book of 1 John chapter 2. How do you know that one has become a, a doctor, or a lawyer, or a plumber, or a carpenter, or a scientist? How do you know that they're an, they've, they've, they're an, they're an expert, or as the world calls, they are, they've mastered their trade? By their degrees and, and by the work that they, that they are able to do. How do you know that you're making progress in the school of Christ, in your divine education? How do, you, how do we demonstrate that we're learning the lessons of the master teacher? Now, what are the works? What are the fruits? What shows how much we are learning of the Creator and how much we love the Creator is by how much we are putting away our sin. Because the more we learn and the more we love, the more we hate sin and put sin away. So, what's, so listen, if I'm learning and I'm, and I'm loving, but I'm not putting away sin, then what's, what's going on there? Is there a problem? Yes. Am I truly being educated after heaven's order? No, no there's, a, there, there's some miseducation. You know we can be miseducated. So the purpose of receiving this knowledge, which is, which is true education and true service, is to safeguard us from temptation and make us like him in character. It is to restore to us the image of God that we might reflect his glory physically, mentally, and spiritually. 
since it is our sin that separates us from God, since it is our love of sin that calls us to fall short of God's glory, something has to be done with the sin problem where it is taken away. And it no longer mars the divine likeness in the soul. 1 John 2. Why has he written this unto us? Not just so that we can know with certainty the knowledge of the truth and give answers to those that will require it of us, but verse 1 of chapter 2, 1 John says, My little children, these things what? Write I unto you, that you what? You could just stop there. What has he written to us? What has he written? His law. What else? The Bible. What else? What else has he written? Has he written anything else? The tables of stone. Habakkuk's tables, the spirit of prophecy. All of this has been written that we what? That's it. We can stop right there. We can close our Bibles. We can pray. That's why he's written it to us, so that we don't sin. And notice what promise we have. Because oftentimes, unfortunately, even though he's written unto us these great and precious promises that we might be partakers of divine nature, he's written it on tables of stone, he's written it on Habakkuk's tables, he's written it in the brown books, the blue books, the, the black books. We often sin. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. And hereby we do know that we know him. Wait a minute. What does it mean to know him? Well, it's going to tell us what it means to know him. But in context, what we're talking about and hereby we do know that we know him, that we have received this knowledge of God, this True education. We're enrolled in the school of Christ as pupils. And we're advancing in the active Christian virtues, climbing Peter's ladder. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, or I've been educated by him. I've, been, I've sat at the feet of Jesus. I have a relationship with him. And keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So how do you know a plumber is a plumber? Well, he's, he knows how to plumb. Electricianer, a carpenter, a scientist, a seamstress. You can tell that they are what they are by what they do. Well, how do we know that we know God? The science of salvation? We keep his commandments. So all true education is going to lead us to put away sin and keep the commandments. When you're not sinning and you're keeping the commandments... What's happening? You're being restored back into the image of God. You're reflecting the glory and character of God. It's very simple. It's, when you think of education, because some say, wait a minute, I, I didn't do too well in school. I had, a, I had a C average. I barely passed. I wasn't on the honors roll. I, I didn't have those um, advanced placement classes. I didn't graduate top of my class. And... Algebra, geometry, oh, trigonometry, calculus, oh, no, 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 I, this is easier than that. You know that you know him, that you're being educated by him if you keep his commandments, and you're not sinning. But if we say that we know him, and we don't keep his commandments, then we're lying. The truth is not in us. Look at verse number 12. Drop your eyes down to verse 12. I write unto you, little children. We're talking about why God has written unto us. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you've known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Why has God written to us? So that we might know the father. 
that we might know that our sins are forgiven, that we might be strong and overcome the wicked one because the word of God abides in you. It, you keep it in your belly, which means you continually feed upon it. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 1 Corinthians, turn with me there, 1 Corinthians. Just looking at a few things here before coming to a close. 1 Corinthians 15. This knowledge is the foundation of all true education and all true service. It is the only real safeguard against temptation. And it is this alone that can make us like God in character. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. So we're seeing a consistent theme and pattern God wants us to be re-educated because unfortunately man ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and therefore the knowledge of evil overrides and oftentimes makes of none effect the knowledge to do good and it's very dangerous and very deadly because it's a mixture of good and evil. See, God doesn't want us God wants us to just do good and good only. God is not good and evil. Satan blends the two. So right at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Satan enrolled his first pupils in his school. And ever since then, man has been enrolling in Satan's university, eating from that same tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what does he receive at the end as his degree or diploma? Death, and before that, the very stamp and mark of the beast. We're not going to go into it right now, but you can clearly show that when man received another education, he received another gospel. And it wasn't the gospel of the three angels. It was the gospel of the three frogs. Perhaps we'll look at that. No, we will look at that, but not today. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 34 says, Awake to righteousness, and what? For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So why do we continue to sin? We don't have the knowledge of God. That's why. We're lacking in this essential knowledge. The knowledge of true education and true service. But the purpose of God, why he's written his word to us from Genesis to Revelation and has given us the spirit of prophecy, the two witnesses, the two candlesticks, the two olive trees and anointed ones is so that we don't sin. That's what it's all about. So God reveals knowledge. He reveals doctrine. He, he reveals prophecy, health reform, dress reform, country living. The reason why this is given to us is that we don't sin. That's why. But we, we have a misunderstanding of what country living is about, what dress reform is about, health reform, why he reveals to us the visions of Daniel and John made plain upon these two tables. Why is he giving it to us? Because if, we're, because if we have these things intellectually, and we're holding it in unrighteousness and still sinning, then we, we're, we're, you're not ready for graduation. You're failing. You're going to be left behind. See, there was a time in school anyway when you did get left behind. Not today, though. I guess I don't know what they're doing in the educational system of the world. They continue to pass you up, pass you up, pass you up. You know you don't understand. But they keep putting you in the higher math classes, keep putting you in the higher English classes. You, you don't understand. We're ruining people. But with God, God is different. God's not going to say, okay, well, you know, you tried your best and yeah, you, well, you didn't fail. You didn't get a D. You didn't get an A or B, but you got a C. So I guess I'm going to let you in. That's not how God works. God doesn't, doesn't work on a curve system. There's no curve with God. Remember, there would be times where the highest, the test result, the highest 
score was a 75. 75 is a C, high C, but 75, if that's the highest score, well then the 75 now becomes the A. So then if you got your 50 or your 40, well hey, listen, I, that 50, 40, that's a fail, but this time I could at least get a, in the C range. That's not how God works. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Either we overcome or we don't. Amen. Amen. Those are the only two grades. Yeah. Wise or foolish, overcomers or non-overcomers, that's it. But awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have the, not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. In other words, if we're still sinning, we don't have the knowledge of God, true education that is restoring us back into the image of God. Now let's go to Proverbs 1, coming to an end. What is the beginning of all knowledge? What are the ABCs? Fear of the Lord. Very simple. Let's look at some things that we're familiar with, but in light of what we're studying today as far as knowledge, true education. Let us look at these verses. Proverbs chapter 1. And these are beautiful verses because... Proverbs could be said to be the book of wisdom. It's the book of knowledge. Every chapter, every verse in Proverbs is talking about wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the what, everybody? But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the very ABCs, the the basic building blocks of all true education and all true service is fearing God. We have to learn how to fear God. We don't fear God today. We have a wrong conception of what it means to fear Him. By the way, what is the first two words of the first angel's message? So understanding then that we learn to fear God, this is the beginning or the foundation of wisdom. It's the, that's why it's the first angel. First angel's message in the everlasting gospel was sent to re-educate us so that we can know how to fear God. That is our problem. The reason why we don't fear to sin against him, the reason why we can commit wickedness, we can commit evil, and it doesn't strike our hearts, it doesn't strike our conscience because we're void of the fear of God. We become hardened and callous, and God has to re-educate us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So then if we don't learn how to fear God, then we're going to end up being fools that despise wisdom and instruction. We've already flunked. We've already failed. Now, what does it mean to fear him? Let's continue reading in Proverbs chapter 1. My son... Hear the, word, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Now remember when we were studying the virtuous woman, and we talked about Proverbs 31, that this was the prophecy that Solomon's mother taught him, that mothers taught prophecy, that wives understand prophecy and would teach. The mothers were the, were the first teachers in Israel. Understand that the educational system in the economy of Israel was based upon not only mother, but even father. The father would give instruction, don't forsake the law of thy mother. You take the time to look at the word law there, and that word law is dealing with the Pentateuch or the Torah. In other words, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And if you take the time to actually get books that talk about the education of a Jewish Young, young man or even a young woman, by the age of 12, they were actually required to memorize the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So we get excited, and we should, when our children can recite one verse in the Bible. But try memorizing 50 chapters in Genesis. Try 40 chapters of Exodus, 27 in Leviticus, 
36 or 37 in numbers and 34 in Deuteronomy. The Waldenses were doing it. They could memorize Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, much of the New Testament. Elder Jane Andrews, in whom the seminary in um, Barron Springs, Michigan, Andrews University is named after, he was our first missionary to Europe, to Switzerland. And he was reported to have been able to memorize all the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation, and he could speak seven languages fluently, all the European languages. So, this is why God has given us true education. Amen. But unfortunately, even though many were able to memorize all of that, unfortunately it wasn't written upon the tables of the heart, and they still apostatized and fell away from Jehovah and served idols. So notice what verse 8 says. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. So the mothers and the fathers would train and teach their children so that they could understand the law and be able to comment and teach from the law. Why should we receive this instruction and law from our father and mother? For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. So is there a connection between law and grace? Yes. In other words, in the law, in the instruction, that's where the grace is found. And it's to be an ornament of grace. In other words, it's to be a crown of grace on your head and chains about thy neck. In other words, royalty royal power so that you can be a prince and an overcomer but also it's on your head and around your neck because this is where the the seat of decision is this is where the governing power of man is found in the will this is the kingly power in your mind and so god says receive this instruction and receive the law of your mother that it might be as 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 an ornament of grace and as chains or necklace around your neck. My son, in verse 10, if, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and hold as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have how many purses? Now, what does that sound like to you? A gang? What else? Conspiracy? Yes. What else? What about a confederacy? What about an unlawful alliance? What about a, a conglomeration, a, a, a gathering of forces? Let us all have just one purse. Many sinners, but just one purse. See, brethren, right here, these are the foundational principles of a one world government, a one world religion a one world economic order, a new world order. Remember Revelation chapter 17, the 10 kings, the 10 horns that have one mind? You see the confederacy of the dragon's forces right here. But notice verse 15, my son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Here's the purpose of true education right here. This is what true education is all about. To keep you from what? To keep your feet from running into evil and in the paths of wicked men, joining this one world order, new world order, or evil confederacy. And notice, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if you truly fear God, then God will keep you from what? He'll keep you from the evil 
confederacies that are out there. He'll keep you from temptation. He'll keep you from peer pressure. This is also a good chapter illustrating what peer pressure is all about as well. And it's not just children and young people that go through peer pressure. Even adults go through peer pressure. It doesn't stop. It just, it just is slightly modified and it changes as you get older. But there's still peer pressure. But if we're rightly educated, if we receive instruction from our father and don't forsake the law of our mother becomes an ornament of grace and as chains to bind us and keep us to, to God and to his love and his truth, then our feet will be kept from going into the path of evil men whose desire is to shed blood. Go to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The reason why we need the beginning of wisdom and knowledge is so that we can be rightly educated, so that our feet does not run swiftly into the path of sin. Proverbs 2, 1 says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. What makes knowledge pleasant to your soul? It's in your belly. It's in your lips. You've eaten it. It's sweet to your soul like honey. Verse 11. When knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, verse 11, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall what? So how are we kept? And discretion and knowledge. True education is to preserve and keep us. Preserve and keep us from what? Look at verse 12. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the path of uprightness to walk in ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked. Wait a minute. Who is the evil man that speaks forward things? Who leaves the path of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness? Who's this evil man? This man of sin? the papacy, the king of the north. What is the purpose of gaining knowledge, wisdom, discretion, and understanding? To keep you from what? Keep you from sin. To keep you from the evil man. In other words, to keep you from developing the image of the man of sin. To keep you from falling into sin, to keep you from apostatizing, to keep you in the path of uprightness and not to leave that and go walk in the ways of darkness. Verse 15, it goes on. Whose, whose, ways, whose ways are crooked and they forward in their paths. To deliver thee from the what? Strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Wait a minute, who's the... Now, true education, delivering you from the way of the evil man that speaketh forward things, who leaves the path of uprightness to walk in ways of darkness and rejoices to do evil, whose ways are crooked and forward. But wait a minute, to deliver thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsakes the guide of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. Who's this strange woman? This is, this is Babylon. We're studying about Babylon. Who is this? Forsaking the guide of her youth and forgetting the covenant of her God? Who is this? 
Yes, it's a church. Which church? This is Rome, but you also realize that Rome has daughters. So not only does this apply to Roman Catholicism, but to apostate Protestantism as well. Look at verse 18. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. What's the purpose of true education? It's to keep you from going down to death and hell. Keep you from that strange woman that flattereth with her words, that's deceptive, that commits fornication, that has and partakes of abominations. It's to keep you from all that. Verse 20, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and trans the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. Go to Proverbs 5, chapter 5. If you, if you study the first seven chapters of Proverbs, you'll see a repeat and enlargement principle. God is showing you that in the first few chapters of Proverbs, the reason why we need true education is so that we can be restored back into the moral image of God, reflect God's glory, don't sin, put away sin, but to keep you from the threefold union of the dragon, beast, and false prophet, and not being partaker of their image and their likeness. Don't receive their mark. Look at Proverbs 5. Again, my son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. Bow thine ear. In other words, humble, surrender. That thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Wait a minute. How do your lips keep knowledge? How do your lips keep knowledge? You got to eat it. You got to partake of it. You have to become one with it. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Wait a minute. Whose mouth is, whose lips drop like honeycomb? Strange woman. So, wait a minute. And her mouth is smoother than oil? Wait a minute, what is oil the symbol of? What is, the, what is the honeycomb a symbol of? The little book, the word. So there's a counterfeit little book. There's a counterfeit Holy Spirit. But even the strange woman can eat the book. A strange woman can eat the book. But it's one thing to eat it. It's another thing to digest it. Where it becomes a part of you and it changes you. Notice what it says in verse 4. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. So, so this, this strange woman, she has a sweet experience, but she also has a bitter experience too. Satan's always trying to counterfeit and counteract the experience of God's people and the prophets as they eat the book. Notice her end is bitter as wormwood and sharp as two-edged sword. What is a sharp two-edged sword? The word of God. So notice, sharp two-edged sword, oil, honeycomb, papacy, apostate Protestantism has an experience in these things. But what's the difference? It doesn't change them. It doesn't convert them. Verse 5 says, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart, from the, depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, come not nigh the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Cruel is another adjective for, for Rome. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger, 
and thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, and say what? How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. What's the purpose of true education? What is the purpose of the knowledge of God? To keep you from hell. To keep you from the grave, the second death. To keep you from having an experience, a sinful and evil experience with the, mist, with, with the mother of harlots, with the dragon, and with the false prophet. That's the purpose. And notice at the end, when, you're, when your flesh and when your body is consumed, you're going to say, I've hated instruction. In other words, I had the knowledge. I, I had truth. I hated it. I, I despised it. That's why Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But oftentimes it's not a lack thereof. It's a rejection of the knowledge. Drop down to verse... Skip down to verse 20. I've hated instruction, my heart despised reproof. Verse 20, And why wilt thou, my son, be ravaged with a strange woman, and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. This knowledge is the only real safeguard against temptation. It is this alone that can make us like God in character. We need true education. This is the third round in Jacob Peter's ladder. I want to close in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I don't want to leave you in hell <laughs> because that's where we ended. The experience of one that despises reproof, hates instruction in the heart is going to go to hell. Death and hell are going to be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Ecclesiastes 7, and there is an education, I mean there is a graduation. been to a graduation before and I remember the various people that were graduating and the different classes that they had, management, mathematics, English, history. And so there's a lot of students out there and they're all coming to get their diploma, shake the hand of the, the president and, and each person as they're walking, their names are being called, names are being called. And it's interesting because there, there were many that might have been there to graduate, but their names weren't read from the roll. So they didn't get to walk, perhaps. You see, brethren, in order for us to walk the streets of gold, in order for us to stand upon the sea of glass and to sing the victory song of Moses and the Lamb, victory over the beast, his image, mark, his number, his name, our name has to be in the Lamb's book of life. If your name is not enrolled in that book, you're not graduating from this life to the life to come. And the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 7, as we close this portion, but we will continue next Sabbath with this study, true education. Pro, um, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 11 says, Wisdom is good with inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Amen. The knowledge that God wants us to receive, the excellency of knowledge, is to give us life. Jesus said he's come that we might have life, and that we might have life more abundantly. And this is life eternal that we might know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 11 and 12. Let us pray. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for what we've been able to learn today regarding true education. True education is the work of redemption. It is to restore the moral image of God and man that he might reflect the glory of the creator. This is the great object of life. This is why you have sent your son Jesus Christ to die on Calvary for us. This is why he continues to minister as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Father, we pray that you would help us to bow down our ear to wisdom, that we would hear the words of the wise, the knowledge that comes from your mouth, that discretion might preserve us and understanding might keep us. Ultimately, it is your purpose that we would sin no more. And that is why you have written these things to us. I pray, Father, that we would begin to eat from the leaves of the tree of life and be reeducated in the school of Christ instead of eating from the, from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that wicked and corrupt tree. That we would not have Satan's stamp and seal on our names, but that we might have the stamp and seal of Christ upon our characters, upon our garments. Please bless us and keep us, Father, from the way of the evil man. Keep us from the evil confederacy. Keep us from the lips of the strange woman that flattereth with her words. Preserve us and keep us from hell and allow the excellency of knowledge to give us wisdom, and through that wisdom to have life, even life eternal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.